it's it's in our hearts. We're thankful for you for uh, all the time that we've been able to enjoy together, for <laughs> all the work we've been able to do with you, the laughter we've been able to share, uh, and to, to know that we get to be together again today, to sing together, look up the voices and song, and above all, open God's word together. Our theme, it still matters. We live in a time where there's a lot of discussion over what matters and what doesn't. What lives matter and what are implied as being not as important, or what are, what are emphasized and what are not. We, we live in a time where uh, it appears that before life exits the womb that it doesn't matter. But we live in a time where if a life has taken other lives deliberately, well, that life really matters and, and needs to be preserved, confined, but preserved instead of uh, defending the defenseless. We live in a time where we've got a lot of things backward as it pertains to what, what matters. And sometimes what can happen, whether we're talking about uh, the value of life, whether we're talking about certain relationships, we can make the mistake of forgetting some of the foundations and allowing some uh, secondary and tertiary ideas to matter more than the fundamental. For instance, you, you look at a, a couple that's married. They've been wed for some 30 years. Now, to them, there are some things that really matter. Making sure that he has a certain pillow and the right number, or her making sure that the, the towels are hanging in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And for each of them, these, these things really matter. But they've forgotten the idea of expressing love and concern for each other. They've forgotten the idea of truly looking out for one another. There are times when we can get to the point that certain things that are mundane seem to matter more than the things that really matter. But if we're going to talk about God, His Word, and what matters, we have to start with foundations. We talk about Scripture, and we ask, do we really believe what the Bible says, first and foremost, about itself? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. What does the Bible say about itself? First and foremost, God is its source, given by inspiration of God. Now, there are those that claim to believe what the Bible has to say. And so often when we're trying to, to reach the lost, when we're trying to talk to our friends and neighbors and co-workers and relatives about God's word and the value of it, they, they take more of a cafeteria approach. Pick and choose this or hold on to that. Paul says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. All, every bit, given by inspiration of God. God breathed. So we're talking about the Bible. We're, we're talking about God speaking. Now, do we believe what it says about itself and about its source? It matters whether or not we accept what Scripture says about itself. Because if I don't believe what it says about itself, why should I believe what it says about God? If I don't believe what it says about its source or the fact that it came from God, why should I believe anything that it says about morality? 2 Peter 2, uh, 1, rather, beginning in verse 2, Peter pointed out that God's divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We have everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that called us to glory and virtue. In other words, but with the same body of knowledge that introduces us and allows us to come to know Christ, we have everything that we need for life and godliness. Well, what body of knowledge allows us to know Christ? Scripture, God's Word, His message. So, we have all we need, which means we have to ask this question. Do we believe what Scripture says about its sufficiency? It's all given in inspiration of God, God breathed. It's profitable for doctrine, what's right. Reproof tells us what's not right, what not to do. Correction tells us how to go from being wrong to being right. And instruction in righteousness, how to stay right. From God, every bit, tells me what's right, and that's all we need. Now, if we claim to believe what Scripture says about itself and about its source and about its efficiency, 
then it's going to matter when it comes to life's questions. Scripture's not going to help me determine which fuel station to use, unless we're talking about principles concerning stewardship and self-preservation, and then I'm probably not going to swing into certain stations where I can tell there's a drug deal taking place, or the one that's charging six bucks a gallon, unless you're in California, you don't have an option. But when it comes to Scripture, there are principles that will help me make these uh, minor decisions in life. But scripture doesn't have a passage that says, thou shalt not shalt be thee. Scripture's going to help me answer the important questions of life. Now, will we let it be our sufficient source for answers? For who God is? For who we're supposed to be? It matters. And it matters that we understand not only what it says about its source, uh, it itself and its source and its sufficiency, but what's this book all about? That's a question that too many have failed to ask or they've assumed certain ideas instead of letting Scripture be the, the answer for that idea. What is the Bible all about? Is it a book of, of codes and, and ciphers so that we can, uh, we can calculate the date of the return of Christ? That's how some people have approached it. One fellow tried to claim that he had done the calculations from Scripture and he knew that the rapture was going to occur in, uh, what was it, May 22nd of 2011. Well, I think he missed it. There are those that look at Scripture as just a body of uh, <coughs> cultural documents that have been preserved. But when we ask what the Bible is all about, as with any other book or document, it has a purpose. If you read a you read a book from Tom Clancy, it's going to build espionage or military tactics. You read a book from, uh, say, John Grisham, a familiar name in this area, it's probably going to pertain to law. You read a book from Stephen King, and it's probably going to be something that he saw when he was experimenting with LSD in the 60s. But, but when you read a book by certain authors, you're going to be reading about certain ideas. God's the author, but what's the thesis? What's the idea? Whether we're talking about a textbook, a novel, every book approaches some idea. What's the point of the Bible? No, let's ask this. What's man's biggest problem? Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Man's biggest problem still matters. Man's biggest problem is not the environment, contrary to all the hot air coming out of Al Gore's mouth that's causing the ozone to deplete. Man's biggest problem is not the education system, contrary to what we're so often told. Man's biggest problem is not the economy, contrary to what every politician is going to tell you from any side of the aisle. Man's biggest problem is not even ethnic relations and who matters. Man's biggest problem is sin. Always has been. From that first time in the Garden of Eden that it occurred, man's biggest problem is sin. The Bible addresses man's biggest problem and supplies God's solution. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Why does this matter? It matters to us because as God's people, if we're going to reach the lost around us, we need to have a right perspective of God's book. Or we, are, we will go out and using it in ways contrary to its intent. <coughs> Brethren, it is far too common for people to go out using facts that are accurate in ways that aren't. For people to go out spouting statements from Scripture with attitudes that are unscriptural. We need to understand what this book's all about. First and foremost, the purpose, the intent of this book, and what we can glean from that, it matters. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's focus on this gift of God. God's gift is the solution for man's problem. Now, we'll start by looking primarily at the need for the gift, or we'll put it this way, the problem. The Bible tells me about my biggest problem. Man's biggest problem is sin. Now, we talk about sin, and depending on who it is with whom you're having a discussion, 
the descriptions of sin and its origins and, and its course are going to be different. There are those that will insist that sin is something that we are born already possessing. There are others that will insist that, that sin is something that no one can really do anyway. It that, that doesn't count anymore. It, it doesn't matter. There are those that suggest that the definitions and, and criteria concerning what qualifies as sin change culturally or with time. What does Scripture have to say about sin? Man's biggest problem is sin. It starts in man's heart. Jo uh, James 1, beginning in verse 13. Let no man say when he's tempted. I'm tempted to God. God can't be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. It's our own desire, our own lust. Key word, we want to remember that one. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. When lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. Sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. By the way, side note, lust, when it is conceived, brings forth sin. <clears throat> lust in and of itself is not inherently sin. Now, Jesus did warn in Matthew 5 that those that whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery already in his heart. When lust is being pursued for the sake of enjoying the, the lust itself, yes, there's sin there. But when lust simply happens or a desire appears and emanates, provided the person is not pursuing and entertaining, lust and desire in of itself is not sinful. It's not a sin to face lust. It's not a sin to be tempted. Jesus was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin in Hebrews 4.15. And if it is a sin to be tempted, then when Jesus was tempted of the devil, even the fact that the temptations were temptations, would, would render him suspect. No. No, Jesus could be tempted and avoid sin, so would he. When we talk about sin, sin's not just the lust. It starts with that. It's not just the temptation, because we can battle that. Sin is when we succumb to the lust and the temptation. Now, it starts in man's heart. I remember James said, don't blame it on God. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. Another idea to keep in mind for down the road. <clears throat> the forms of lust, John would describe as lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. 1 John 2, 16. We talk about these desires, these lusts, lust of the flesh. It's something that a person desires because there's a, a physical urge. Now maybe it pertains to and an emotional reaction and the desire stems from that. Maybe it pertains to some other physiological idea. Uh, maybe it's just hunger or the desire for intimacy and a pleasurable embrace. Whatever the nature of the lust uh, in terms of the direction it leads, it, this particular area of lust, lust of the flesh, pertains to a desire that the body has. It's not a sin to be hungry. It's not a sin to eat. But when satiating the hunger by acquiring food involves theft or dishonesty, you've got a problem. Lust of the flesh means that we're drawn to pursue a course of action because of a fleshly urge. Or then there's lust of the eye. Lust of the eye is when something is desired just because it looks good. It's, uh, it, it can be common for someone to see a, a particular vehicle. We, <laughs> recently, uh, we had the privilege of being down in Georgia visiting uh, the Lithia Springs congregation. And not far from where they are, there is a, a classic car consignment shop with some 200 vehicles. Walking down those rows of old Chevelles and Camaros and several Mustangs, it, it's not hard to see the beauty in the vehicles, to, to see what is aesthetically pleasing. And let's go ahead and face it, uh, masculinely pleasing. <laughs> Lust of the eye. I appreciate the, the appearance of it. One, because it looks good. Then there's pride of life. 
You know, you can apply that to those cars as well. Because some want some want the four fifty four because it's bigger than the three fifty. Just to, to say, I've got a bit more. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. We can see these desires in areas where they can easily be pursued properly, but we can also easily see these desires leading to improper behavior. Sin starts in the heart, and soon after personal desires, and it leads to death. The wages of sin is death. Now, what would be a definition of sin? We, we can talk about descriptions, but what's a definition of sin? We're not talking about uh, when Paul listed various ungodly behaviors, 1 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 9. We're not talking about the works of the flesh, Galatians 5, 19. We're talking about definitions, not descriptions or, or examples. Four brief definitions. Sin can be defined as breaking God's law. 1 John 3, 4, whosoever sinneth transgresseth also the law. For sin is transgression of the law. Sin is lawlessness, as the American standard has it. So, God says, thou shalt not. And a person says, no, I think I will. Sin. God says, do this. And a person says, mm, not going to do it. Sin. If God says, thou shalt, and I say no. If God says, thou shalt not, and I say, oh, oh yeah. We're talking about sin. Violating God's law. Sin is also ungodliness. 1 John 5, 17, all unrighteousness is sin. Now, John was saying that same verse, there's a sin that is not unto death. He's talking about the sin for which one, one will confess it and repent of it, described back in 1 John chapter 1. For our purposes, all ungodliness is sin. Or all unrighteousness, rather, is sin. Sin is unrighteousness. Now, what's going to be important to remember about this is the fact that when we talk about what righteousness is, God didn't define righteousness one day in uh, eternity. He's thinking, well, we've got lying and we've got truth. Any, many, many, mo. God didn't just arbitrarily determine that truth is good and lying is bad. He, God did not arbitrarily determine that the, that fidelity in marriage is good and infidelity and uh, promiscuity is bad. God did not define righteousness based on whims or arbitrary decisions. Righteousness is defined by what God is. Righteousness is a reflection of God's nature. God cannot lie. Not because he decided one day, no, I don't want to lie anymore. No, he cannot lie. It's not who he is. It's completely uh, opposed to his very identity. All unrighteousness is sin. So when I venture into the behavior of what is unrighteous, I actually venture into the realm of behavior that is a direct assault and affront against the nature of God, against God's identity. So I sin when I violate God's law. I sin when I do unrighteousness and oppose God in and of himself. I sin when I omit God in my plans. James 4, beginning in verse 13. James said, go to now, and you can say today, tomorrow. We'll go into such a city. We'll continue their year. We'll buy and sell. We'll get gain. Today or tomorrow, we're going to go. Here's where we're going. Here's what we're going to do. Here's where we're going to stay. And here's what the outcome will be. Now, these folks had big plans. But the problem was, James said, what well, y'all say is the Lord will. We shall do this, live and do this or that. You don't know how shall be on the market. With all of their plans, they left God out. James corrects them for this mindset and then points out, James 4, 16, that now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Their plans that they had or, uh, organized but omitted God in them, James says, this self-rejoicing and omitting God is evil. When we get to James 4, 17, he says, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, well, the good they were supposed to be doing was including God in their plan. James says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. It still matters that we include God in our plans. And we, when we omit God from those plans, yes, it's still sin. Now, let's apply that just briefly. You think about the person that's looking at 
uh, starting a new career. Oh, this career is going to pay big money. But it's going to keep me away from worship and it's going to require that I'm dishonest every now and then. Has that person included God in his plans? Or you talk about the person that's <clears throat> coming to the age of, oh, I desire to be married. And I'm going to find me a cute young man with a rich daddy. I don't care if he cares about God or not. Has she included God in her plans? Now, maybe it's the family that's going on vacation. They know the hotel where they're going to stay, and then all the sites they're going to see, all the restaurants where they're going to dine, but they've not taken a lick of effort to look into where they're going to be worshiping while they're away. Have they included God in their plans? In the both to do good, do it, and not to him to sin. And the good to be doing is including God in our plans, do we? So I said when I <clears throat> break God's law, when I leave God out of my plans, when I do unrighteousness, and Romans 14, I said when I violate the conscience. The Apostle Paul speaks to Christians about him that is weak in the faith, receive you, but not without the disputation. Now, one that's weak in the faith is not of weak faith. Let's repeat that. The one that is weak in the faith is not weak in faith. He's weak, he's in the faith. What's weak about him is not his faith. What's weak about him is his conscience. 1 Corinthians 8, 12, and 13, Paul points out that when you so sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8 and 1 Corinthians 10, the Apostle Paul deals with scenarios where brethren have certain activities which they refuse to engage in doing. But Paul points out that whether it's a certain food to be eaten or a day to be observed, Paul points out that it doesn't amount to a hill of beans. No, he does not use those exact words. But that's the point that he makes. The man that eats, eats unto God. The man that doesn't eat, unto God he doesn't eat. In other words, everyone's doing it unto God with full sincerity. There's, there's no difference other than doing something with the full conviction of knowing that it's acceptable or abstaining if, if we're not certain. By the time we get to the end of Romans 14, Paul said, he, he that eateth, let him do the faith. But he that uh, eateth not of faith is faith is damned if he eat if he do because he does it not of faith. The one that feels guilty about engaging in a particular action, but he does it anyway. Well, whatsoever is not of faith is sin, Romans 14, 23. We might apply this today when we're talking about someone who's he's a recovered alcoholic. By the way, this recovering alcoholic idea. Um, once a person has repented and put the sin in the past, he's repented. Now, he may be susceptible to a temptation, but he's not still an alcoholic. Just like the one that was once a gambler that no longer gambles is not still a gambler. That's not where he lives his life. When we talk about this idea of uh, the conscience, <clears throat> we think about an alcoholic who says, you know, I know that I'm susceptible to this temptation. I don't want to. I don't be drawn to it. So, so when I go to eat, I can't go to. I can't go into Chili's because there's a bar there. I just, I, I just don't feel comfortable. Can a man make that rule for himself for the betterment of his own decisions? Absolutely. But can he tell the brother, no, you shouldn't go eat at Chili's because there's a bar there? Now wait a minute. Where are you going to get your groceries, there, buddy? Because we're going to be consistent. If I refuse to. Uh, be a patron of any establishment that sells uh, anything that, uh, that is questionable, then I don't know where you can go shopping. So we have to be consistent, and we have to be willing to realize that there are certain areas where for the betterment of my conscience, I need to set this rule. But I can enforce it on other folks. I said when I break God's law, I sin when I do what God calls unrighteous. I, I'm attacking his very identity. I sin when I leave God out of my plans. I sin when I violate my conscience. Now, with those ideas in mind, man's biggest problem is sin. But Romans 14, 23, whereas the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. A wage. That's interesting. When we talk about a wage, a wage is something you earn. 
When I work for sin, I earn a paycheck, and that paycheck is dead. <coughs> when, when I first entered the workforce back in 19, none of your business, uh, the minimum wage was about four fifteen an hour. The, the, the minimum amount a person could be paid for an hour's worth of work. Now it's what, like forty one fifty or something. But back then it was four fifteen an hour. Minimum wage. The minimum amount a person can be paid. When Friday rolls around and it's time to go get the paycheck, how many people say, uh, walk away with that envelope and say, well, I'm sure glad for this money they gave me, uh, this gift they handed me. Frankly, having visited some stores and some restaurants, there are some people that ought to be saying that. But how many people actually walk away saying, well, I'm, I'm sure glad for this money I didn't earn. No, it's a paycheck. We approach with the idea of earning this, right? The wages of sin is death. When I work for sin, I earn a paycheck, and it's death. But the gift. Now, a gift, that's something you can't earn. A gift is something that's given. But the gift of God is eternal life. Not just life, but eternal life. The very thing that man uh, declined by engaging in sin. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift of God is eternal life, and it's only accessible through Christ. Now, it's at this point that we want to stop and consider something. Can a person offer another individual a gift? A gift that the recipient could not earn, could not merit, but still have expectations for the recipient to obtain the gift. For instance, can a parent have a child that turns 16, 17, and it's starting to drive, and, and tell that child, you will be able to use this vehicle. This vehicle's worth five, eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000, whatever, nowadays, 50, 80, 100, you can use this vehicle. But your grades have to remain at a certain level. You have to engage, you have to perform these duties, these chores around the house, and you have to follow these rules about conduct and time. Now, is that child earning money by making those grades? <coughs> is that child paying off the vehicle by carrying out certain household chores? Has the child earned the vehicle by behaving a certain way? It's still a gift, but a gift that comes with requirements. Or the local radio station from Memphis calls Rick Pope Joy, your name's been drawing one thousand dollars. We just need you to come downtown and collect your prize. If Rick doesn't drive downtown, we get that money. If he goes, did he earn it? It's still a gift. He had to do something to go get it. It's going to be helpful for us to keep in mind when we're talking about our friends in the world that yes, it is by grace that we are saved through faith, that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. Amen. Ephesians two eight. But God can offer a gift and expect me to do something to come get it. A gift we can never earn, never merit, but there's still a requirement. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, let's take this approach. We know what man's biggest problem is. It's sin. And sin is still sin. Violation of God's law is still violation of God's law. Uh, an affront against God is still an affront against God. And the solution is still the same. We're asking, is this what the Bible's all about? Let, let's ask this question. When did sin start? Be back in Genesis 3, right? Let's turn our pages all the way back. We'll start in Genesis 2. The Lord God formed man with the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, man became a living soul, Genesis 2 7. God puts man in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 2 15. He says, dress it and keep it. God gave man a job to do. Now, God said, dress it and keep it. What if man said, no, I'm, I'm going to take these sticks and I'm going to invent the lounge chair. And I'm going to take these leaves and drive out and run water through them. And I'm going to invent myself some tea. Oh, wait, look, there's a sugar plant. Sweet tea. And I'm going to take my lounge chair and my sweet tea. And I'm going to kick back and I'm going to enjoy me a few years of do nothing. God said, dress it and keep it. If man said, I ain't going to do it, what's he done? See God gave man a law. From the start, God said, dress it and keep it. Then he said, of any tree of the garden, 
Thou mayest eat freely, Genesis 2, 16, but of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, and of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. <laughs> Genesis 2, 17, he gave them a prohibition. There's a positive command, dress it, keep it. There's a permissive allowance. Eat whatever you want to eat out of. Knock yourself out. But stay away from this one. There's a prohibition. God gave man a law. If man does what God says not to do, he sins. If man declines what God says to do, he sins. We keep that in mind as we come to Genesis 3 because Satan gives man a lie. When we fed it to the woman, actually. When he says, God said, thou shalt not eat of every tree. Remember, he's more subtle than any beast of the field that the Lord made, Genesis 3 and 1. The woman didn't fall for it. No, no, of any tree of the garden we may eat. Now, it's interesting. God had said in Genesis 3, 16, of any tree that's in the garden, thou shalt eat freely. The devil threw one word in there, not. Thou shalt not eat. What God had said is leave this one alone. Thou shalt not eat of every tree. No, God said we can eat of every tree, but the tree that's in the midst of the garden. God said, Thou shalt not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. I want to keep that in mind. The devil replies, Thou shalt not surely die. God knows that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be open. You'll be as God, knowing good and evil. A couple of thoughts. First, you're trying to make God seem restrictive. God's not letting you enjoy every tree. Just like those peers of teenagers, when their parents let them engage in all of these activities and those activities and go to this place and that place and enjoy this privilege and that privilege. But then one event comes along that the parents say, no, I'm not going to be able to do that. Your parents won't let you do that. That was the devil's tactic. By the way, it's also a reflection of gross immaturity. God won't let you do that. I'm trying to make God seem restrictive. Instilling them a mindset of rebellion and bucking authority. Then he tried to make God seem dishonest. Thou shalt not surely die. God said, thou shalt surely die. The devil said, no you won't. Those two propositions cannot be true at the same time. One of them has to be wrong. And the devil wants her to believe that it's God that's wrong. Therefore, either God is mistaken or dishonest. He's conveying God as a lie. So he portrays God as restrictive, dishonest, and then he says, here's the problem. See, God knows when you eat that, you're going to get to be just like him. And God doesn't want you to have all of his privileges. God doesn't want you to know what he knows. He tries to make God seem selfish. Now, she looks at the fruit, Genesis 3, 6. She sees that it's good for food. Hmm, good for food. Food sustains our body, right? Loves the flesh. She sees that it's pleasant to the eye. Pleasant to the eye. Hmm. Gentlemen, have, have your wives ever requested or perhaps hawk-tied and dragged you to a store like a Pier 1 or a Kirkland? One of those home, home decoration stores? One of those stores where you're walking around thinking, what one of them this do? But, uh, but she loves it because we don't think in decorative terms more often than not. Now, inside these stores, there's always going to be at least one kitchen table. In the middle of the kitchen table, there's going to be a basket or a bowl. What's in the bowl? Fruit. You know why? Because it looks good. Eve was the world's first interior decorator. She saw that fruit just looked good. She wanted it. It was decorative. She saw that it was good for food, lust of the flesh, pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise. Pride of life. It's going to elevate her above the station that God has given because where God has put her is not good enough for her. She wants more. <clears throat> now, side note, before we move forward, usually we talk about Eve. And somewhere along the line, we get in the uh, get it in our minds. If it hadn't been for Eve, life sure would be better. If it hadn't been for Eve, we wouldn't have to worry about buying clothes. We'd save some money, right? And if it hadn't been for Eve, think about what the devil just did to her. He unloaded his full arsenal. Lust of flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life, hitting her all at once. Have you ever committed a single sin on any occasion 
because of just one of those areas of lust? Because of only the desire of lust of the flesh? Or only the desire because it looked good? Or only the desire of the pride of life? If you've ever committed one single sin for just one of those reasons, then we have no right to question Eve. Because she faced it all at one time. Yeah, look at all. Oh, and by the way, usually when we talk about Eve, at some point the husband's elbow goes into his wife's ribs. Yes, the woman's fault. But notice, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave to her husband with her. And he did eat. Somewhere along the lines, we got in our minds that she ate of the fruit and said, oh, I need to share this with Adam, and went gallivanting across the garden. Adam, Adam, here, take a nibble. No. He's standing right there. And as Paul later describes, 1 Timothy chapter 2, she was deceived. He was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Adam was right there, and he wasn't duped. Yet he kept his mouth shut and did nothing. Why? Because he was letting her do what she wanted to do instead of taking the role of authority that God had given him to exercise. So, here's what's happened. Has she violated God's law? Absolutely. Have they left God out of their plans? Have they uh, done, done what God would call unrighteous? In other words, violated God's identity? Absolutely. Have they violated their conscience? A quick thought here. Genesis 2, 16, God had said, thou shalt not eat of it. Genesis 3, 3 and 4, Eve said, oh, well, we're not supposed to touch it. If we look at what God said, specifically assigned to God and not coming from the mouth of Eve, God just said, don't eat it. But somewhere along the lines, it appears, between Genesis 2, 16 and Genesis 3, 3 and following, they decided, well, God said, don't eat it, we're not going to touch it. Based on what God said in Genesis 2.16, and yes, maybe somewhere along the line after Genesis 2.16, God said don't touch it. But based on God's words in Genesis 2.16, they could have built a treehouse in that tree, and as long as they don't eat it, they're fine. They could have invented the game of baseball using that fruit if it were the right shape, and it would have been fine, as long as they're not eating it. But they're smarter than that. Anyone ever come into contact with a winter fence? Maybe hit it with your leg, your hand, or make a mistake if you think you're going to hop over it and, and you straddle and something slips and with a shocking experience. Been there, done that. So I've got a rule. If I can look up at the house or the, wherever the charger station may be, and, and I can see that the, the charger is unplugged, guess what I'm still not going to do? I'm not going to touch it. Do not make contact with that unless I have to do so. And then that's only through certain safety precautions because I know what I can do. It's called pain up. They've essentially put themselves an electric fence around that tree. It's called their conscience. They said, we're not going to touch it. But Genesis 3, 6, she took of the fruit thereof. Whether it was inherently sinful, for, uh, uh, not to touch it doesn't matter anymore because there's a matter of conscience involved. Left God out of the plans, committed unrighteous, did, uh, broke God's law, violated the conscience. They sinned. God gave man a law. Satan gave man a lie. Man gave way to sin. It wasn't just her, it was him too. So, picking up at Genesis 3, 7, moving forward, they hide. God comes walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They've made themselves aprons. They're hiding. Adam, where art thou? God didn't ask because he didn't know. God knew what happened when it happened. God came walking in the garden. God came to them because God always takes the first step and reconciles them, even when he's done nothing wrong. I hid because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? Again, God doesn't ask because he needs the information. He asks so that man can learn something from him. The, the woman that you gave me. Remember, when, let no man say he's tempted, I'm tempted to God, yet man tried to blame God for that first sin. The woman you gave me. Then God turns to the woman and says, what have you done? But with the serpent of God, I can only imagine the devil's face. Smiling when she looks at the fruit. Grinning big whenever she eats of it and gives to her husband. Probably hopping and dancing whenever they try to hide from God. And then when they blame God, confession. 
just a celebration. He can't hurt God. The only way that he can damage God is to separate God from the pinnacle of his creation, man. And now it seems that he's done that. And so God says, Genesis 3, 14, the serpent, the animal, you're going to be on your belly the rest of your days. But he says to Satan, Genesis 3, 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Remember, the wages of sin is death. The gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ. Genesis 3.15, God said he was going to land a death knell on the serpent, Satan, through one that would be bruised in the process, one that would be born as the seed of a woman. Now, there's only one that was ever born as the seed of a woman, the one of whom Isaiah prophesied, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. From the first time sin occurred, God had a plan. He mentioned what he was going to do to take care of man's sin problem. We've seen man's problem. We've seen God's uh, prescription, God's plan. Now here, very quickly, Christ's purpose. Genesis 3 describes the, the need for Christ. Now that's the warning bell, right? Or is that the final bell? That's it. All right. Then I'm going to take two minutes. Here. When Jesus came, what did he come to do? Genesis 3, uh, the angel told uh, Joseph, you're going to call him Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. Jesus said himself, son of man has come to seek and save that which was lost, Luke 19, 10. Now in order to save souls, Jesus shed his blood, Matthew 26, 28, this is my blood that will be for the shed for many for the remission of sins. When he came, man's, uh, God's prescription for man's sin problem, he came to save souls, and he shed his blood to do it. Now, we get to talk about how he came to fulfill God's will. He came to uh, fulfill the law, do the will of the Father. He came that we might have life and have it abundantly. But all of those are really just different descriptions of the same thing. He came to do two things, save souls. And he told his apostles, Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock I'll build the church. He came to save souls and build his church. And by the way, the same blood that was needed for him to save souls, Gen uh, Acts 20, 28, feed the church of God with the purpose of his own blood. The solution for man's sin problem, the purpose of Scripture is Christ. And when Christ came, he came to save souls and to build a church. Now, it's interesting. Salvation was fully extended, Acts chapter 2. Whoever calls the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's when the church was established. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Why does it matter? Why is it important? Because if I'm going to understand the purpose of this, it means understanding that sin is the problem. That Jesus is the answer. And then when Jesus came, he came to do two things, save souls and build his church. If I had this mindset that the church is unimportant, the church is negligible or optional, I don't understand this, I don't understand him, and I don't understand eternity. So yes, it still matters. Thank you for your extra time, and for not throwing any tomatoes. Uh, looking forward to drinking. <laughs>